webinar or watching on YouTube or any certificates of any kind for that matter. So please um, do not email us for certificates. Uh, You're not going to get them. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to stop my share, screen sharing here and hand it over to Mahin. Mahin, over to you. Thanks, Chandu, and good morning, everyone. And it's a really beautiful morning here in Bangalore, and I hope it's a great morning wherever you are. Um, we never thought that science talks was a great way to start a Sunday morning, but here we are. And this is, um, Pavitra, how many, how many of these have we done so far? We've done a few. Uh, and yeah, six. How probably. many? Probably, probably yes. Yeah, so it's been about a month and a half of these fantastic ways to wake up on a Sunday morning. And, um, and to get us going. And if you're here with, uh, with your kids, I'm really happy um, because this entire session really is um, for kids and it's for high schoolers and, and, and kids going to college. Um, the initiative is by Sodhamani and we saw great potential in it. And so we picked it up and we ran with it. And now we've been doing it every Sunday. So please keep your eyes open for uh, the talks that are upcoming. You can also check out our YouTube stream for past talks. We've had uh, a host of some phenomenal speakers and I'm really happy to introduce um, this week's speakers, Shannon Olson, who's one of my favorite scientists. But before that, um, I think I'm gonna let Saudamani actually introduce Shannon because it, it is her show. But anyway, um, that's, that's it from me for Outside In and please stay for the duration of the talk. It's really going to be worth your while. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Shannon Olson. Uh, she leads the NICE group, which is uh, nothing but natural inspired chemical uh, ecology group. And uh, their group is interested in how animals, uh, especially insects, uh, kind of recognize their environment and objects around them. Uh, so that means they go to different exotic places, be it Himalayas or the Western Guards, um, also Bangalore. Uh, to look for these events and then uh, try to understand them uh, at the scientific level. And uh, Shannon uh, had got her a PhD from Cornell University and uh, she had uh, also uh, worked in the Max Planck Institute in uh, chemical ecology in Germany. And uh, that means uh, she had collaborated with engineers and biologists uh, equally. And uh, she has uh, a Ramanujan Fellowship and she's also a Fulbright Scholar and uh, she's given a variety of talks to a variety of audience, including TEDx and Inc. Uh, so however, what I personally feel is um, uh, her uh, talks reach the audience so well, and she prepares the audience. For example, we have had, we had, had one uh, uh, talk in within the faculty, because she's my colleague in uh, National Center for Biological Sciences, where I also work. Uh, so in one of the talks that she was giving, she had uh, wanted to present how the insects perceive um, flowers and is it by because of their color, meaning through their vision or is it because from their smell? And to uh, understand this, uh, she had set up some artificial flowers and, and to convey that information, she had put lots of little uh, paper flowers all, in, all around the room. So just so that the audience can participate. Uh, yes, I think that chemo uh, ecology people have uh, wonderful experiments. Uh, so just to say that how powerfully uh, Shannon tries to convey her science. And uh, today, uh, uh, please, Shannon, uh, you start off this talk. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Sodomini. Sodomini has also been a great mentor to me since I came to NCBS. I've often asked her for advice, and she's always been very willing to help and, and uh, I've been very giving. Um, in addition to a number of efforts she's had on our campus. One of my favorites is her involvement in our crash, which as a, as a working mother, I have been incredibly grateful to continuously throughout my time in, in India. Um, so I hope you can hear me. Uh, I, if there's any issues with the, the audio, I hope that, that you will let me know. And I will start sharing my screen so that I can begin the presentation. So, um, and I hope this is fine. So today's talk is about this, this very famous quote. You may have heard this quote before. The creator, if he exists, has an inordinate fondness for beetles. It's actually not sure whether this man, J.B.S. Haldane, actually said this quote, but it is 
generally attributed to him. And Haldane was a very, very famous scientist, uh, especially to us biologists. He was a famous geneticist. He was also one of the fathers of many of our ideas in evolutionary biology. And he was really, really interested in these concepts throughout his life. And he was also very much interested in India. In fact, he became a, a citizen of India and he worked for many years at the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. So, so um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, life he had. So I hope you'll read up on it. And he gave this quote that the creator has an inordinate fondness for beetles. And you may wonder what that means. Well, it means this. So this is the famous tree of life. This is a, the most, one of the most current trees that we have. This is our current understanding of how all multicellular and unicellular life evolved on this planet. Of course, it evolved unicellularly back from bacteria and then we started to get multicellular life, uh, yeast, and then plants, and then all the way up through. And if you look here in the, um, I'm going to see if I can get my annotation. Um, yeah, there. Um, just let me do the spotlight there. If that's what I want. If you look here, let me close this. You can, oh, I can't do it. Anyways, in the center of the screen, this large pink region, this is actually all of the invertebrates, the non-vertebrate animals without a backbone. And this covers everything from worms all the way up to octopus. But the vast majority of these species happens to be in the group Arthropoda. Arthropoda is the major group that encompasses the insects and the spiders and the crabs. And there's a huge number of them. In fact, if you add all, all of multicellular life together, which includes our multicellular microbes, our fungi, our plants, our vertebrates and invertebrates, by number of species, they nearly equal the number of known species of insects on the planet right now, which means we have almost as many insects and arthropods as we do everything else put together. It's phenomenal diversity. Insects have remarkable number of adaptations to survive on this planet. They exist in almost every ecosystem known to man except for the deep sea. We've even found them being able to exist in outer space. As you may know, the, uh, the water bears have been actually released into the, into the vacuum of space and they have been able to survive. They are considered a very, uh, very a primitive uh, form of, of insect in the hexapods and they are they have been able to survive as well so insects are phenomenal and that's the story i'm going to tell you about today and my interest in insects goes back a long ways so this is my daughter actually flying a kite in my hometown into poister new york and uh and this is what it looks like there this is what it looks like uh just a maybe a month or two from now as it starts to be in the autumn and the trees start to change color. It's a beautiful area. It's, it's a very rural area. In fact, I grew up working on my aunt's farm, which is just actually down the street to the left of this picture. And I grew up surrounded by insects. I grew up catching fireflies. I grew up catching caterpillars and watching them metamorphose into, into moths and butterflies. And I love ladybugs. So insects were very much a part of my, my growing up in this very small rural area. But for many of us, especially here, we live in a place like this. This is a, a drone shot of Bangalore, right? where many of us live, and we live in these huge cities, right? And so our experience with insects is completely different than it, it was for me growing up in that tiny village. If you come from a village, you may have had a similar experience to me growing up, but if you've grown up in a city like my daughter has in Bangalore, then your experience with insects is more like this, right? You get cockroaches and mosquitoes and flies, and these are all generally considered bad, right? Mosquitoes bring diseases like dengue and chikungunya and, and malaria. Flies poop on our dinner plates and are gross and disgusting and we need to have a fly swatter to get them away. And cockroaches are the curse of our kitchens and we don't want them to be there. And so we have to use the Lakshmi Reka to get them away and, and keep away things like ants as well. So our 
impression of insects, especially in our uh, growing up in our urban environments is a very poor one. And we are generally afraid of insects. And when I work with small children, uh, oftentimes they're afraid of insects at a very young age. Um, but this is not something that is born in you. This is something that is taught by your environment. You are taught to be afraid of insects because of these bad things that you, you, you know that they bring. And, and it's true. It, they do have, cause a lot of damage. They do bring diseases. They do eat up our crops, but they also serve incredibly important ecosystem services like pollinating our flowers and pollinating our fruits and vegetables and also maintaining our lands. Even termites serve a very important purpose in the world by, by uh, maintaining nutrient cycling in the soil. So actually most of the insects of those millions that I mentioned at early in the talk are actually beneficial to us but we know very little about them. So the purpose of my talk today is actually tell you a few stories about, about interesting insects, some of which you may know, but hopefully some of them are new to you, and maybe to give you a, a little bit more appreciative, appreciation of, of insects. And, and in India, we still know very, very little about our insects. Um, they're largely unknown. Most of the studies on insects were done actually in the 1800s. And since then, there's been just pockets. There's been some very, very good research going here and there in the country. We have the, the, the um, BSI and the ZSI who have been working hard trying to identify some of our insect species as have many of our institutes across the country, but it's way too little for the number of insects we have in our biodiversity hotspots that we have in the country. So I hope we may inspire some of you, especially our younger members of the audience to maybe think about becoming entomologists because they're pretty cool. So I hope you'll see why in a second. So I'll start with the insect Olympics. Insects have amazing adaptations. I mentioned this. Not only have they adapted to survive in all sorts of different areas of the world, but they've also had amazing adaptation, adaptations to their body and their physiology to allow them to have really unique behaviors. Take this insect, for example. This is a caterpillar, right? It's a pretty common caterpillar group. It's found all over the world, but this particular genus, which is by a colleague of mine, Dan Rubinoff in the University of Hawaii, is quite unique. So the Hawaiian islands, as you may know, are very isolated. They're really out in the middle of the ocean. So a lot of the animals that have either evolved or ended up on that island from being transported from, from other areas have also adapted to those islands in some pretty unique ways. This particular group of, of caterpillars called the hyposmacoma caterpillars have done something truly remarkable. Caterpillars eat what? I'll let you think about that. What do caterpillars usually eat? You can see it right here in the picture. Most caterpillars eat plants, but these caterpillars have evolved to eat lots of different things, including snails. So they do something really amazing. So they sneak up on a snail that's resting on a leaf like this one. And you can see the caterpillar coming out and it actually uses its silk glands, which most caterpillars have, to weave a web around the snail and tie it down where it then can start to eat the snail. So this is a remarkable adaptation because this really means that they've taken a, a, an herbivorous or a plant eating caterpillar and it has evolved to become carnivorous or meat eating and it eats snails and it also is able to spin a web like a spider. Phenomenal adaptations from this amazing little caterpillar species. This group of caterpillars has also been able to evolve some other really remarkable adaptations such as actually being aquatic. So here's a cousin of that last snail eating caterpillar I mentioned. And this caterpillar is actually aquatic. It actually is able to survive. And in fact, it thrives under the water. You can't live underwater, <laughs> not, not at least at this moment. So imagine what adaptations it must have to be able to get the right amounts of oxygen and other nutrients while fully submerged for its entire larval stage. Pretty remarkable. And this is all in just one genus or one small group of, of these caterpillars. So here's another example, and this one is right in our backyards. Actually, this species of, of, of this group of insects actually exists in India as it does across South and Southeast Asia. 
And this doesn't look like an insect, does it? No, this looks like, a, like an orchid, right? And it is, in fact, it is an orchid. But if you watch very closely, you'll see these beautiful pink and purple orchids. Is it an orchid? Yes, it's an orchid, but maybe something else is there as well. Actually, in the center of this orchid, if you look closely, you'll actually see a praying mantis. This is called the orchid mantis. It's a beautiful species of, of often pink and purple colors because it sits in the middle of the orchid and you can see its head there and its little antenna and it waits patiently in the center of this orchid and pretends to be an orchid and it bathes itself in the floral volatile so it smells like an orchid and then as soon as an unsuspecting insect comes to drink from the nectar or pollen, it grabs it and eats it. What a remarkable adaptation. So this mant mantid has evolved not only to look like the orchid, but also to produce the smells of the orchid. And obviously, if you're an unsuspecting fly or butterfly, you won't be able to see the difference because it stands completely still. Even I couldn't see much of a difference in these, in these mantids. So this is a remarkable adaptation. And here's another one. This is one of my favorites. This is one of the first stories I ever heard when I was a student myself about these. And it's one of the things that got me interested in working on insects in the first place. Obviously, if you're astute, you know this is not an insect. This is actually an arachnid, a spider. Spiders are closely related to insects. And oftentimes when you study entomology, you actually study both insects and spiders because they are so closely related. This is a story about this particular spider. It's called a bola spider. And like many spiders, it does spin webs. And many spiders spin webs up in the, the trees or in, in the eaves of houses. Some of them spin webs on the ground like funnel spiders. And some of them spin webs on the grass itself like wolf spiders. Well, this bola spider does spin a web in a ver vertical fashion, but it also does, does something very unique. If you see on the right hand side of the image, you can see this sort of string hanging down. And this is actually a piece of the web that it is dangling down on one of its forelegs. And it has on the end of it a sticky globular substance. And here's what it does with it. It actually becomes a cowboy and it has a lasso and it actually swings the, the bola around like a lasso of a cowboy in the wild west and it swings it around and that swinging motion and actually a unique smell that it releases from that bullet is actually able to produce the pheromones of male moths in many of the species. And it actually releases those chemicals. And eventually, because the moth sees this moving object and it smells nice to the moth, it gets caught on the end of the bola. And then the spider brings it up and then it, it uses it for dinner. What a remarkable adaptation to become a cowboy as a spider. So those are pretty cool adaptations, right? But one of the things that's really hard to do, right, especially because we're mostly creeped out by insects, many people are, and, and you know, you may be as well, but actually is to think about that many things that they have to do in their lives are actually very similar to ours. So I often talk about empathic science. It's something that's very core to, to my own beliefs as a scientist is that in order to really appreciate the living world, we have to understand how it relates to our lives and how we relate to it and really be able to put ourselves in the, in the tiny little six shoes of, of an insect. So really being able to think about insect lives, I, I just want to tell a few stories of how actually they go through a lot of the same struggles as we do in their lives. And I'll start with, of course, what happens about the age of a lot of the people in this audience, I imagine that you're also starting to maybe think about finding someone to settle down with, or maybe you're being pushed by your parents to do so. And so what do you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to look for someone to, to marry, right? And you have to, so you're looking for love. And what do you think you do? What do you do if you're going to look to find somebody good to be with? Well, you have to think about looking good and also smelling good as well. And so do insects. These are called orchid bees. They're called the, they're the Euglossini genus and they're beautiful, right? Look at their beautiful color. So they look pretty good, I would say, but they also do something remarkable. 
they grow up in the rainforest and they fly through the rainforest to all these different flowers and they have special sacks on their bodies where they can store the odor of the flowers. So they create this unique perfume for themselves and the males do this. So the males fly through the rainforest, go to all these different flowers, collect the scents of the flowers, bring them back to, to a specific location and they fan them out like Axe body spray, right? And they smell all nice and lovely until they can attract the ladies. So the, the males that smell the nicest to the ladies are the ones that get the mate. So just like, you know, a young guy putting on too much cologne or Axe body sprays, these bees do the same thing. So not that different, is it? You also have to have the right moves. Maybe some of you love to dance. Um, it, you know, unfortunately, TikTok's not around in India anymore. But you know, that was a big thing to to be have the right moves on TikTok. I saw all sorts of people doing it. So. This is also true for our insect world as well. In fact, it's true for this particular spider. This is called the peacock spider. There are a whole group of spiders that are native to Australia and they have remarkable moves. They also look pretty cool as well. So here's a male peacock spider and he's sitting on a leaf and I'll watch, I'll show you what he does. So he goes to a place where he can find a lady and he's looking, he's looking, looking, looking and he has just now. He's just about to spot a female. And you'll see her in one of the next images here. There she is. So she's getting ready. She's getting ready to watch him. And he's going to start his dance. So this is pretty amazing. You can find these videos online if you haven't seen him. Here he goes. So he lifts his forelegs and he fans out a special structure on his, on his abdomen that brightly colored and he shakes his moneymaker <laughs> back and forth. And each species of these peacock spiders has unique moves. They have unique coloration, they have unique patterns and they display for the females and try to get her to decide whether to mate with him or not. And I have a very, very sad thing to tell you. In, this, in some of these species, if he doesn't dance well enough, and if she's not actually very appreciative of his dance, then she eats him at the end. So the kind of the lady wins either way, either she gets a mate or she gets her lunch. So, you know, just remember that next time you're trying to dance. Remarkable, isn't it? Also, Maybe you've already attracted the attention of a, of a potential lady or man of your choosing. Well, it's also important that you bring them the right gifts, okay? At the very end, you got to bring them a wedding, a wedding present, right? A wedding ring, at least for me, you know, had to, had to happen. And a wedding ring, if you're a dung beetle, is this ball of dung. Dung beetles, I'm sure you've seen, they're extremely common in India as well. And I'm sure you know that they roll their dungs for dung balls for food, but actually what this dung ball is called is a nuptial gift or a wedding gift. Because most of these species, the male actually creates this ball as a present for the female. The female eats the ball and she also buries the ball and lays her egg on the ball and that's what the babies will eat for the first few days of their lives while they're actually growing. So the size and the quality of the dung ball that the male creates is a form of a, of a gift and she can turn the male down if she doesn't like the ball that he's giving. So, you know, you know one man's poop is another man's treasure or an insect in this case. So, you found someone, you found someone to settle down with and now it's time for you to make a home together. And the most important thing to do is to make a safe and prosperous home for you to raise your children in. And here's where we get to kind of the scary portion of the, of the session where I present to you the burying beetle. Beautiful beetle, right? It's got a beautiful orange back to it. But actually, the way it creates a home is by doing this. It's called the burying beetle for obvious reasons because it buries things. So here's a video that was taken by Nat Geo and it's showing these beetles. So the male and the female, when they have chosen each other as mates, they start to create a hole in the ground, moving around the soil to create a pit called a crypt. And in that crypt, they drag 
a dead animal. In this case, it's a mole. And they drag this animal down into the crypt, both the male and the female do. And they start to remove all of the extraneous things from the body of the animal. They remove the fur, they remove the scales or feathers if it's a bird or, or another sort of animal. And they roll the carcass up into a very tight ball, not so different than what the dung beetle does, but in this case, it's not dung, it's actually a carcass of an animal. And the male and the female roll this ball up and then they create a hole in the top of the carcass, as you can see here, really gross, isn't it? in which they use to feed their babies. And their babies have this unique adaptation that you can see here called begging behavior, where they actually rear up on their hind legs, which is a very unique behavior for, for a, a larvae of an insect to do. And they beg for food, just like baby birds do. And the parents both feed them. And they'll feed them for several days until the larvae are old enough to really eat the carcass on their own. So, you know, just like you may bring good food home to your, to your children, you men and women in the audience, so do these, but it just happens to be a dead animal. And while this may seem really gross to you, this actually is an important ecosystem service because they get rid of a lot of the dead carcasses of animals on this planet. And because of that, they do this in a very um, disease-free way because they maintain this carcass and they remove the mold and bacteria from this carcass so that it's very clean for their babies. So it's a really, really good way of decomposing animals. So as gross as it may be, it's also important for our ecosystems. You know, maybe you want to go out, right? You want to do you want to do something else. You don't want to be home all the time, right? I mean, you know, you need to have a date night. I rarely have date nights. Actually, Mahin has given me a date night on one, one occasion with our with our daughter Grace. And so, you know, sometimes you need a babysitter. Well, if you happen to be a giant water bug, then actually the babysitter is the dad. The dad actually becomes a babysitter in many of the cases, and in one of the cases, it actually carries the eggs around on its back until they hatch. The female literally glues the eggs to the back of this Bellastomidae. That's the, the group of these giant water bugs. And he has to go around carrying these eggs around, keeping them wet, keeping them moist, keeping them aerated with oxygen until they're ready to hatch. It's an enormous job and it's actually a very dangerous one because these, uh, these beetles can no longer fly away from predators because their wings are literally glued down by the eggs. So in case you men out there think that, you know, it's only humans that have to even think about childcare. Actually, male parental childcare is quite common in the animal kingdom. It's actually more common in the animal kingdom than I think it is for us humans in many cases. So maybe think about that next time your wife asks you to take care of the kids, that actually you're just doing something that giant water bugs do to their own peril in many cases. When your kids start to grow up a little bit, they have to go to school. Right? They have to start to learn things. And one of the questions I always got when I was teaching classes was actually to try to understand how it is that insects are able to learn from each other. And I remember always being asked this question, can insects watch each other and learn like we humans can? And I always said, there is no evidence for this that I've ever seen. And that was true until this study came out. This is a fantastic study and it was done in bumblebees. And it came out a few years ago now in about 2016 and they've done a series of studies beyond this. But it's, it's truly remarkable. It really blew my mind. Bumblebees, as we know, are, are social organisms. They're not as social as honeybees are, but they do form, form colonies, okay? And what these researchers did was they did this really cool experiment where they had honey water inside these blue discs that you see on the screen right now. And so the, the, and it was underneath a plexiglass sheet. So the only way that the bumblebees could get to the honey water was by pulling on the string, which is, which is not an obvious behavior for a bumblebee to do. They don't pull on strings, right? So the researchers, what they would do is they would show one of the bees how to do this many times until the bee learned how to do it. And then they wanted to see, could bees teach each other? Like a teacher, teaches you, right, in school. Could they actually teach each other? So what we see in this video is the bee 
with the red little marking is the experienced bee, okay? And the other bee is a naive bee. So it doesn't really know what to do right now, but it's watching the other bee, you see? And it's watching the bee that's experienced on how it's very, very good at pulling on that string. And through watching, it's actually able to do this behavior as well, which I'll show you uh, in, in a minute here as the video goes on. Okay. So you can see the bee is still watching. And from this, the bee is able to learn how to actually pull the string herself. And actually what these researchers have found is actually that these bumblebees are actually able to spread the information through the colony itself, which is called cultural transmission of information. I'm doing this right now in this webinar, cultural transmission of information, but we didn't really know that insects were really able to do this until these studies started to come out. And now we realize that insects can even teach each other just through watching or through sometimes smelling or hearing each other. So it's fabulous. You also have to make friends, right? In the sense that it's important also for insects and arthropods to know who the enemy is, right? Who is going to help you and who is going to kill you? And the way that some insects do this is by recognizing each other's faces. When I was a graduate student at Cornell, one of my fellow students, her name was Liz Tibbetts. She did this remarkable experiment on paper wasps. Paper wasps, as you know, build wasps that are a very thin material that feels like paper. So that's why, where the name comes from. They build hives and they have little brood cells and they recognize each other and their nest mates by the patterns on their faces. So as you can see here on the right, these are all different types of paper wasps. They're all the same species, but they have slightly different patterns on their faces. And those patterns help them to tell each other. They'll be like, oh, oh that's Pavan. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's Priya. Oh, nice, nice. So they can tell who each other is by the, the, the patterns on their faces. And so what Liz did was she actually spent a lot of her PhD painting the faces of these wasps to make them look like each other, much like you might wear a Halloween mask or a mask on your face to change your appearance. So she would change their appearance by putting tiny little pieces of, of paint on their faces to obscure some of these patterns. And what happened was when she changed their faces so that they no longer looked like a nest mate, the wasp would attack the, this, this, this other wasp as if it was a stranger and kick it out even though it was actually a nest mate. So this showed her that actually these wasps are able to recognize each other's faces. It's also been found that they can also recognize some human faces as well. So they have an incredibly good ability to recognize faces. Maybe we should be using these wasps for our facial recognition software and not, uh, not the computers. <laughs> so for the last part of the talk, I, I just want to talk a little bit about why? Why we should care about insects? I mean, yes, of course. Cool stories, right? Really fun stories that you can tell each other over, over dinner, right? But also they serve incredibly important services. I mentioned this at the beginning, that mostly we think about insects as being, uh, being uh, dangerous or difficult for, for us in terms of eating our crops or bringing disease. But they mostly serve very important beneficial functions, such as they cycle nutrients. I mentioned this about termites. You also saw this with the burying beetle. They break down food, they break down plant matter and animal matter, and they allow better circulation of those nutrients, better access of those nutrients to bacteria, so it can produce nitrogen and oxygen and all sorts of nutrients on this planet. They are incredibly important for that surface. They also regulate the plant abundance. Now we often think of plants as being a good thing and they are. And we often think about planting more trees and planting more plants, but of course you can have too much of a good thing. And one of the things that insects do, we usually think of it as a bad thing that they eat our crops and our plants, but actually by maintaining and controlling the plant life, they actually keep it in check so that it's balanced within the ecosystem. They're also a food source. We also have 
a huge important food chain and insects are one of the major, major sources of that. A recent beautiful atlas of, of Indian birds came out and these, these researchers noticed that among other things, the birds that eat insects were actually being hurt a lot more than other types of birds and because that's because they rely on the insects, but our insects are disappearing as I'll get to in a moment. And they also provide some population control. They, it, these insects that are predatory, that actually control the plants and animal matter also keep the ecosystem in balance so that we don't have an imbalance in the number of anything, any too many animals, too many plants around. So they also serve these incredible purposes. And they're also an inspiration to us. This beetle from Namibia, from the desert on the, on the left, actually lives in the desert and gets its, its um, water from the fog. So it travels to a, a high surface and it opens up its back so that the fog water droplets can condense on its back. And this has actually ins inspired bio um, technologists to come up with a new, new material to actually collect water more efficiently. And in the top right, you can see a Drosophila. As we know, fruit flies are a very important system for biologists to understand everything from genetics to molecular biology to neuroscience. And NCBS, my campus, was one of the progenitors of that because our founder, Obeid Siddiqui, was really one of the fathers of using fruit flies to understand neuroscience and olfaction, which is my field. So fruit flies are also extremely important for scientists. And what you saw at the bottom that just flew away was a ladybug. And insect flight has also inspired lots of researchers to understand how we can better fly because actually insects are one of the few groups of organisms on our planet that have been able to conquer the skies. They also serve other purposes. Uh, they're of course a main, main example for evolutionary biology. I mentioned how quickly they've adapted to their environment. What we see on the left are these peppered moths. And you can see that the peppered moths are actually changing color. They're becoming darker. And scientists noticed many, many years ago in England that in very polluted areas where there was lots of soot and smoke that the peppered moths became darker in color. And they noticed this as an adaptation that led to greater understanding of how evolution functions. Also, Social organisms like bees and these ants actually serve great, great inspiration for optimizing social systems and they serve as econo for economists ways of actually optimizing supply and demand. So ant colony optimization is a, is a very commonly used uh, set of concepts that in e economics that actually come from our understanding of ants. And we all know in India how important, how important insects can be for our economy. The silk moth is one such example of that that we know well. I mean, the entire uh, silk industry relies on this one tiny species of moth to be able to produce this beautiful substance that is incredibly strong. But we have problems, right? There actually are increasingly evidence across the world that our insects are actually going away at very, very quick rates. So we're showing actually massive losses of insect biomass. So biomass is the amount of insects. In fact, some studies have shown that the insect biomass has decreased up to 80%. Now to put that number into context for you. So we have about 8 billion people on the planet. So Imagine when I was born about 40 years ago that there were 8 billion people. There weren't then, but just imagine that there were. And now 40 years later, there's only 2 billion people. We would be freaking out, right? Because most of our people had suddenly disappeared. And that's exactly what's happening to our insect populations. But yet it's something that we don't even think about. But you may realize this when you travel, if, you, if you're a little bit older, you may remember in your younger days when you were traveling in the vehicle, catching insects on your windshield and having them just pepper the windshield, especially in the, the post monsoon or the warmer times of the year when there were a lot of insects. And you hardly see that at all anymore, particularly in Bangalore, hardly any insects hit our windshields. And that is the best evidence that I have seen of actually that we're losing our insects at alarming rates. Why? Well, we're taking up a lot of space. I mean, look at Bangalore. This is a, a, an image of Bangalore at night. We have, we're building 
man-made structures and changing the way our land looks. And that actually takes up a lot of the ecosystems where our insects would actually be living. We're using pesticides. Pesticides are a stupid name, if I can be honest. It's not actually a pesticide. Pesticides are actually insecticides and they kill indiscriminately. They not only kill the insects that harm our crops, but they also kill a lot of the beneficial insects as well. And the more we use pesticides or insecticides, the more damage we're doing to our, also our beneficial insect populations. And we're changing the way our land looks. We're changing agricultural and, and forest land and, and getting rid of habitats where our insects might otherwise be living. And one of the things that, that my lab has done over the past few years is looked at another possible contributor, which is actually pollution. So we looked at air pollution because as you may know, nine of the 10 most polluted cities in the world now reside in India. And that's even true despite this pandemic where we talk about the air pollution getting better, but it's still still quite a bit, bit uh, worse in India than it is in some other places in the world. So a postdoc of mine, Yita, she looked at this particular species of insect that you might recognize. It's called the giant Asian honeybee, Apis dorsata. And she looked at it in various regions of Bangalore that had differing levels of pollution. And she observed it as it was feeding on this plant, which you also may recognize. This is a really common ornamental tree grown all over India. It's called Tacoma stands. And the honeybees loved this plant because it had lots of nectar and pollen. She observed it all different areas and she did find in fact that as you got more urban and especially more polluted, there were fewer bees visiting the plants in different regions of Bangalore. But we weren't sure if this was because of pollution or maybe because of they couldn't get food or they couldn't get other things, there was less water or the temperature was different. So we decided to look at the bees. So this is the very first image that we ever took from a scanning electron microscope image of the bee's body. And this was a bee that was collected from our campus, which is a relatively low polluted area because it's in North Bangalore. And I hope you can see on the surface of this bee body, all these little, little looks like seeds, right? But they're actually pollen grains. And this is because this was a foraging bee and she was doing her job. This is the same image of a bee collected from Pina, which those of you in Bangalore may know as the industrial area of the city, one of them, and it's a very polluted area. And on the surface of this bee are a few pollen grains here or there. If you look hard, you can find them. But actually what is there is a bunch of debris. It's a bunch of crap, which is actually called respirable suspended particulate matter. It's breathable particles of air pollution. And they contain things like this when we studied what they were made of, lead and arsenic and tungsten, chromium cobalt, all sorts of chemicals, heavy metals that we know to be very, very toxic to not only humans, but all organisms and were found on the bee's body. So we wondered, is this having a problem for the inside of the bee's body? So we did a bunch of experiments as well by looking at things like their heartbeat. So this is the heartbeat of a bee collected from a low polluted region of our city in which happened to be our campus. And then here on the right, you can see the heartbeat of a bee uh, from a highly polluted region. And I hope you can see, I don't know how well the video is working, but that the, the, the heartbeat of the bee from a highly polluted region is quite altered. The heart rate is not altered, but what is altered is the rhythmicity of the beating. So this is called cardiac arrhythmia. And if you go to the hospital and you have cardiac arrhythmia, you're in big trouble. This is very, very dangerous as it is for these bees. So we found that actually almost 80% of the bees collected from these more polluted regions were dead within 24 hours of bringing them back to the lab, even when we fed them. So this is a study that came out. It's going to come out in a couple of weeks from our lab. And I hope that you will spread the word about what we are doing to our insects. And I'll leave you with a little bit of hope because it's not, it, the hope is not lost. There are things that you can do as well out there. One of them, of course, is that you can promote our ecosystems. You can promote the planting of trees, the cleaning up of our environments, the planting of green areas, the maintenance of green areas, promote a, a a recovery of our forests and restoration of our habitats. That's where our insects live as well, not just our tigers and elephants. And our insects are some of the basis of our food chain. So they're very, very important to our survival. If you can, 
Try to eat food that you know where it's grown. When you know it's grown with reduced pesticides, if you have the means to do so, try to buy food that's not using pesticides as well at all, that is organically grown. If you can grow your own food, grow flowers on your windowsills outside. Give these insects a, a chance to find these flowers and to feed on them, to promote insect life even in our cities. Bangalore has a remarkable insect diversity. I can find all sorts of insects right in the confines of the city itself, but we have to give them places to survive. And as we make our concrete jungles, we can make them more green. So I hope that you will look towards that. So I will end and take some questions by just sharing this quote, which is a very special quote to me, but it's actually a very meaningful one. And I hope you will think about this going forward. And it's about this insect extinction. And it says, but to think about the coming invertebrate extinctions is to confront a different dimension of loss. So much will vanish before we even knew it was there, before we even had begun to understand it. Species aren't just names or points in an evolutionary tree or abstract sequences of DNA. They encode countless millennia of complex interactions between plant and animal, soil and air. Each species carries with it behaviors we have only begun to witness. Chemical tricks honed over a million generations, whole worlds of mimicry and violence, maternal care and carnal exuberance. To know that all this will disappear is like watching a library burn without being able to pick up a single book. Our role in this destruction is a kind of vandalism against their history and ours as well. I hope going forward, you will help make this world a better place. So thank you very much. And with that, I will take some questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, and we've shared the uh, list of resources you had uh, shared with us earlier. Uh, I think this has given us all a lot of food for thought in terms of the cute things that insects do, as well as the you know um, more sort of unfortunate aspect of their uh, reduction of their population. So uh, we have some questions about, um, uh, you know, specific insects that you mentioned. So someone has a question about the name of the aquatic caterpillar that you sh uh, showed us. Um, do you, can you share yep. that? I am going to put it in the chat box. Okay, great. It uh -huh. is called hyposmocoma and if you go to that that drive link there's actually an article by my by my friend dan about those caterpillars so you can read it for yourself so if you have you obviously have access to the internet or you wouldn't be talking seeing me right now so please go to that drive and one of the uh, one of the articles is about these hyposmocoma caterpillars okay that's great and um so there's uh, a question about uh, the major difference um, of between insects found in a freshwater habitat and a marine habitat, I guess this has fascinated everyone, these aquatic uh, insects. So maybe you can say something about that? If yeah, you... that's, a, that's a really good question. They actually don't know. This is actually a really active field of study. Um, I think sometimes that when we present these stories, they seem like they're like old stories and we know everything about them. But actually, I like to present stories for which we don't know everything. They don't really know all the adaptations that these caterpillars have. Um, it's a bit hard to find them. Uh, if, I, I don't know if you've ever been to Hawaii, but if you've seen pictures of Hawaii, it's volcanic islands, right? So it's actually very hard to travel around and it's a little hard to get to these caterpillars. And they don't, they're not easy to rear in the lab. So actually I tried to bring some back with me to Germany when I was at Max Planck and they didn't make it. I tried to make them from my friend because I wanted to study this exact question, but unfortunately they didn't survive. So at one point I was thinking of moving to Hawaii. I still maybe think about that. Maybe that's a good idea for me to do, to move to Hawaii to study these caterpillars. I almost did it once so so yeah i don't know we don't know we're still studying that question maybe whoever asked that question can can uh can go to hawaii and do it okay sounds interesting and I, I mean all of these ecology talks just keep leading us to the fact that you know we don't know a lot about insects and someone is asking about you know um i don't know if you know the answer to this but which part of the world has the maximum diversity of insects versus which has the least so um, it's not one area, 
In fact, um, India has tremendous biodiversity. Uh, we have 17% of the world's biodiversity hotspots, which is actually a really large percentage considering I think we're only about three to five percentage of the land. I, I can't, I'm sorry if I, my number might be off. I, I don't have it in front of me right now, but we have a small amount of the land, but a large amount of diversity. And in general, in general, as you go from the tropical areas near the equator, you get more and more diversity. And there's a lot of theories for why that is. One is that, of course, the, the habitat is more consistent all year round, right? You know, where my husband is from in northern Sweden, you know, right now it's almost daylight all the time. And in the wintertime, it will be almost dark all the time. Okay, that's really not very fun. And it's incredibly cold. And, and you know, we humans can survive it, but insects in order to survive, they have to hibernate and they have to go somewhere where they can keep themselves warm and keep them from freezing over the winter. That's a very difficult adaptation to get. So very few insects have been able to do that. You don't need to do that in the tropics. So that's one reason why there might be more insects. The other thing that, that can make create diversity is competition. We see this in India all the time. We're a highly competitive <laughs> group of, of people in India as well. And in order to survive a competition, you have to be unique, right? You have to do something that nobody else does. And so that's that actually drives adaptations as well. So this competition for space, competition for food has led to all these remarkable adaptations like the orchid the orchid uh, mantis that I mentioned, but also many of these species also are exist in India as well, burying beetles and dung beetles, so. Yeah, I think all of the insects you've mentioned have created questions, you know. Um, so someone's asking about whether burying beetles, are they exclusively carcass feeders or how are they surviving if they don't find a carcass, for instance? They search for carcasses, okay? They search and search and search and search. And, you know, they, they go, they live in areas where they're more likely to find carcasses, right? That's obviously one thing you do. You go where you're going to be more, more likely to find food. They also can, uh, they also can hibernate for some time, actually. So they can also wait for a time where they are able to find food. So yes, I believe they are. I don't, they cannot, they don't eat, you know, plant matter. Okay. Okay, I think that answers that. Uh, so we have a high school student who's asking about, uh, you know, apparently uh, students are told that it's okay to kill insects because there are too many of them. So um, he says, you know, but they, you, uh, but they are facing extinction. So can you explain kind of this dichotomy maybe of why people think that, you know, we have too many insects? Maybe it's the ones that annoy us. Well, it's by, you know, I mean, by biomass, we do, I mean, the, the most biomass on the planet is probably bacteria. And then it's, it would say it's plants, but insects aren't far behind that. There are, all, there are a lot of insects, which I think is the reason why we feel like it's not a problem. We don't realize because you still see insects. I'm sure all of you see insects. There's nobody that's like, no, I've never seen a butterfly. I mean, of course you see insects all over the place, but it's, it's, Despite that, there are a, there is a massive decrease, and I, I do think the windshield, which I know is a story that that Mahin always likes, is, is a really good indicator of that. If you're old enough to remember what it was like to drive, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I remember it when I was growing up. How many insects would hit the windshield? And now that doesn't happen nearly as much, right? Um, so is it okay to kill insects? I mean, well, obviously, if a mosquito is trying to bite you. <laughs> And it may carry disease. I mean, you have to protect yourself. I'm not going to say, you know, no, 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 don't kill any insects. And obviously, you know, if a crop is being overrun by by locusts or other insects, then the farmer has very little choice but the, but to apply pesticides. The thing is, is to try to be more pre preparative rather than reactive. We, we are a reactive species. This crisis that we're going through is such a good example of that. We didn't prepare ourselves and now we're having to react to a crisis. So rather than reacting to an imbalance where we have too many mosquitoes or too many pests, let's create ecosystems and better resilient strategies so that we live in line with these insects, you know? And that's, that's what we used to do. 
When you go back 100 years in India, that's how people lived. People lived with their ecology because they had little choice otherwise. And I think they understood a lot better traditional techniques, traditional knowledge that is still used in our, many of our tribal communities is invaluable because they know how to create this balance and prevent these sort of imbalances where we have to use things like pesticides. Yeah, I think that's very true. And uh, I think we'll take a question now from someone who's raised their hand. Uh, Veda Smirta, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, okay. I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, maybe we'll go to the next person who's raised their hand. Um, uh, okay, uh, Krishna Kant, go ahead and please try to keep your questions brief. I know you have a lot of them, but yes, that would be good. Uh, good afternoon, madam. Uh, hello, uh, can I hear me, madam? Yes, I can. Uh, uh, madam, if you show any insect which are unknown for us, how how we know that that insect is uh, harmful to us or uh, or uh, toxic for us means uh, it is a, a bite or not bite how we can know by its morphological characters madam so um many insects can't bite right i mean uh, so so in order to bite they have to have particular mouth parts that allow them to and those are usually insects that actually have adapted to to eat meat right or to uh, like a mosquito has a special proboscis to in order to pierce the flesh of 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 animals like like humans and also other other mammals so um so they have to have adapted and most species do not have that capability right moths and butterflies except for a very 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 special exceptions cannot actually pierce our 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 skin most flies cannot most beetles cannot as well you have to, you know we call those giant water bugs i mentioned where the daddy daycare they are called toe biters because they actually do have an adaptation because they actually do they are carnivorous and they actually can sting and inject toxins into their prey but most animals will not harm you if you don't harm them. We learn this about lots of animals, like, like snakes, right? You know, we learn that, that snakes are actually more afraid of you than you are of them. So one of the things is to just, you know, not mess with them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just uh, just to uh, don't uh, don't try to antagonize them. But most insects don't have the ability to bite you. The vast majority. Okay, thank you, madam. Thank you, and um, we'll go to another question um, from someone who's raised their hand. Uh, Pranav, go ahead. Uh, yes. So basically, the thing that I wanted to ask that, like, when I was very when I was small, so what happened that there was this spider which bit me. So like it gave me rashes all over the body, but when I, I just had this doubt that is it that only this one species of spider does it because usually you said that insects don't bite most of them. So is it this only one species of spider or these are found everywhere or something like that? It, it was a spider you said? I'm sorry, you were a little muffled. Was yes, it a spider? It was a spider, yes. Yeah, I mean, so again, you know, not not all spiders uh, are are toxic to humans. Um, a lot of them produce toxins that don't have any effect on humans. There are some very poisonous species. Um, you know, most of the time they will bite you because they they are they're protecting themselves. So, you know, maybe you inadvertently brushed against it or thing. I mean, they, they won't just come up to you and attack you. That, that's very weird for any animal to do. The only, the only insect that I know that does that is a mosquito because it actually needs to come to you to drink your, drink your blood, right, and feed. But, but most animals will not do that. So there are some poisonous spiders. There are some extremely, extremely poisonous spiders, in fact. Um, but but most of them are, are innocuous, and also in India as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to a few of our questions in the Q and A, where we have a lot of questions actually. Um, there is someone asking about, um, you know, the ways that you can observe uh, insects in your area and kind of, you know, maybe uh, like keep a log or something like that. So how can you observe and study insects found around you? 
I love this question. Thank you to whoever asked this question. Um, it's funny, every student I've ever had, unless they come to me with experience with insects, they have no eyes. We call them eyes for insect or insect eyes because they can't, they can't see them. They, they think there's nothing here. They'll look around, they'll we'll go outside into a garden. They'll say, nope, nothing here, nothing here. And if they're quiet and they're patient and you just sit and maybe sit in front of a, of a tree or, or, you know, and just watch. After a while, you'll start to see something, usually ants because ants are everywhere, maybe some flies. And then as you keep watching, you'll start to start see more and more insects. And then you'll get your insect eyes as I call them. And you'll be able to see them everywhere. And honestly, once you start seeing insects, you can't stop seeing them. They're just everywhere. My daughter hates going on walks with me because I'm always stopping and looking at something. Oh, what's that? You know, because I see them everywhere. And you can too. The best thing to do is to just sit they still don't move very much. Wear, wear if you can, um, dark clothing that's not super bright and super apparent and that has a lot of patterns on it. And just keep your eyes open. It's, it's also a very good way of meditating as well. So I encourage everyone to do this. And, and, um, and most of those insects you're going to see are going to be beneficial. Ants are very beneficial to our environments. Great. Thank you for that uh, set of tips, actually. And uh, so people are asking about, you know, maybe species that indicate in an environment that the ecosystem is doing well. So what species can you kind of focus on to see how well an ecosystem is doing? Is there some particular species you can look at? So in general, just abundance of insects is a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem because insects, as I mentioned, have many different adaptations. There's, there's ones that eat plants, there's ones that eat organisms, there's ones that break down dead, dead, dead matter. And so having a diversity of insects itself is a very good indicator of a healthy ecosystem. We've often heard that frogs and birds are presence of, of good uh, of good ecosystems and guess what most frogs and birds eat insects so so I mean honestly if you see a lot of different types of insects in a habitat that means that habitat's probably quite healthy and doing doing very well because if there's going to be insects there that you're going to get birds you're going to get frogs you're going to get lizards you're going to get the things that eat the insects as well um, so I can't I cannot emphasize enough beyond my talk, you know, how important they are. So if you see them, then it's a good thing. Okay, uh, great. We'll take another question uh, with, with someone wants to ask live. Uh, Janani, go ahead. Um, Janani, please ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, about the paper beetles, do the do they naturally have some individual identities in the face or body to recognize their nest mates or uh, do they recognize them by their order or something? No, they reckon, so that's an awesome question. Good, you can come and work in my lab. So, so yeah, they actually, so number one, paper wasps rec can recognize each other as kin by smell because their nest has a special smell. You may, know this is like your house, right? You, you probably know your home where you grow up has a special smell. You know that smell and you recognize, you maybe can't even remember that smell. And every time you smell it on some clothing or something, I go, ah, that smells like my house. So paper wasps can tell each other's houses by smell, but they're actually born with these facial uh, changes. So they actually have these unique facial structures that they're born with. And that's actually how they can tell each other apart as individuals. It's, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Um, awesome. So um, there are a bunch of questions. Um, so someone wants to know about uh, bees because bees are very, very popular among our uh, our crowd. So they want to know about, you know, um, how uh, the debris is actually like affecting the bees. Maybe they can read the paper. Is that something we could do? Yes, if you wait about two weeks, I hope the paper will come out and then you can read all about it. Yeah, so it's, uh, but I can, I can just briefly summarize it. So it, it seems that it's affecting um, 
their heart, I mentioned, I showed their heartbeat, it's affecting their heart rhythmicity, it's affecting the blood cells in their body. Um, insects have blood just like we do, it, it circulate, circulates a bit differently, they have an open circulatory system, they don't have veins like we do, um, but they have, a, they have something called hemocytes, their, their blood cells are called, and we found that in polluted area, the number of living hemocytes or living blood cells was very, very hugely decreased. We found differences in expression of genes in their body and proteins that were coded for stress or toxins or immunity, which makes a lot of sense. So it looks like they're responding to pollution as if it were a disease or if it were a toxin on their body. Um, and, and also we found a big difference in their survival as well. So this actually allowed us to create um, an air quality index for these insects. Um, you've probably heard of the air quality index. You hear about it all the time in, in around December in Delhi and they'll say, oh, Delhi was over 200 today. And that, I mean, you've maybe wondered what does that mean, okay? So that's just, it's a, it's a, it's a number that has actually been created by, by, by us to actually give a level of air pollution, mainly caused by respiratory suspended particulate matter, but also by other things like uh, carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide and other sorts of pollutants. And it's a number that tells us at which level do humans start to get affected, right? At which level is it harder for humans to breathe or do, do vulnerable humans like very elderly or immunocompromised individuals start to have problems because of the air pollution? And the higher the number, the worse it is. But that's all for humans, right? So until our study, there really were very, very few studies on how air pollution was affecting other organisms and none that could really put a number on things. So our number can put a number on what pollution levels actually start impacting the bees. And I'll tell you, unfortunately, the air quality index for insects is much more sensitive than it is for humans. So the levels at which humans are just getting slightly affected, nearly 80% of our insects are dead. So, so that's actually a huge difference. And it was surprising because I actually thought it would be the other way around. You know, humans are, or insects are so adaptive and they're so remarkable as I showed you that I thought they'd be more resilient to air pollution, but it turns out that they're, they're not, it's quite the opposite, so. Okay, great. I think that answers uh, quite a few questions about that. And um, we'll let uh, uh, the person who raised their hand on, uh, ask. Uh, go ahead, Veda Smirta. Hello, ma'am. My question is that you told fruit flies, the dorsophila, are used for genetic study. What makes it so special for using chromosomal study other than other insects? Well, many things. Actually, um, there's a journal called eLife. Um, which is uh, which you can look up E L I F E, um, and they did this really cool uh, series about like what makes model insects mo or model organisms model organisms, right? We hear about things, something called E. coli, Escherichia coli, as a model bacteria. We have uh, C. elegans as a model worm. We have the the mouse as a model mammal. So we have model systems. We have a model plant, Arabidopsis. Like how did they become model systems, right? So th that's kind of your question you're asking. Well, one is fruit flies are pretty easy to get. You put out a banana in your house, you got a you got fruit flies, right? It's pretty easy to get. They have an incredibly short generation time, which is really important if you're doing genetic studies. If you're doing a genetic study, you don't want to wait a year to get your next generation. So fruit flies have very rapid, rapid generation time. So that allows us to go through a lot of generations in a very short period of time, which is necessary for genetic studies. Um, they're also very, uh, very few number of cells in their body as compared to, to um, mammal like us. They have only a few hundred thousand neurons in their brain, in their body. So that actually helps us to, um, to get a better sense of their nervous system and really track it genetically because we can count the number of cells in its body. Um, so, so all of these reasons make it a really good choice for a model system, but it's always a bit of serendipity too. It, it required, you know, uh, Morgan and others to, to really start using these organisms. So actually the history of how fruit flies became a, became a model system has been the subject of, of movies as well. I, I, I can't remember, we showed the movie at NCBS a couple of years ago and I can't remember the name of it. So, um, but, but uh, you know, maybe we can look that up for you. You can, you can email me about it. So yeah, it's a very interesting thing how model organisms become model organisms. 
Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Shannon. And um, in so again, and for someone who's a budding insect enthusiast, um, they want to know uh if there's some way to like learn about the morphology and and names from uh, a photograph, for instance. So, is there a resource for that that you could suggest? You mean to identify insects? Yeah, from like if they take a photograph of one. Yes, so there, there are some there are some resources. Um, so one of our one of our scientists at NCBS, Krishnameg Kunte, he has a, a series of beautiful sites, uh, mainly for butterflies, but also for some other other organisms as well. He has I found butterflies. Right, that's one of the sites. There's also iNaturalist. Um, and you can actually do one of the, the simple things and a, a really quick cheat you can do. Um, if you really don't even know where to start, you don't even know, is this a butterfly or a beetle or what is this thing? Is to do a reverse image search on Google. So if you have a really clear image of an insect, a reverse search can help you a little bit. It can help you sometimes even find the exact species or sometimes get a, a very similar sort of organism. So you at least know where to start. And then you can start going from there. But I Naturalist and I, I found Butterflies, Krishna Meg's website and others are really good websites for that. There's also um, there's also a lot of the, the museums can also help you as well um, if you really are interested in studying it. Eventually, to know the species, you often have to have a sample available. You can only go so far with a picture because you actually have to look at very specific characters of the legs or the body. But, um, but you can usually get at least the general idea of what the what the group of insects you're working on is, or you're, you're taking a picture of is so okay that's I think that's pretty good advice for anyone who's just starting out and um, so we have a lot of questions I, I don't know is there anything else you would like to particularly address uh, people are asking about honeybees uh, fruit flies um, everything so is there anything you'd like to add Does the boa spider become a prey to some birds or other animals? Uh, so as far as I know, the, the smell that the boa spider produces is very specific for, um, for uh, the moths that it's trying to attract. I don't believe that there's any birds that can detect that particular smell because it's actually a moth pheromone. Um, of, and, and one of the things is that it, these, these Spiders hunt at night during the time that the moths are active. Moths are also a lot of times active at night. And that's probably not a time where birds are out and about. They're often trying to sleep at that time. So, so one of the things that you can do always is you can avoid being doing your job at the time where somebody else is going to eat you. So uh, Stephen Hawking said that killing all the bees will be devastating and end the life on Earth. What could be the reason for his remark? Well, I, I hope that my study or my, my talk clarified a little bit of that and that they're so important for so many aspects of our ecosystems, you know, that insects declining, they can come back. We can get the, it's not the end, you know, now we can get them back. Um, but we humans rely on our ecosystems much more than our ecosystems rely on us humans. It's always a misnomer that we're some sort of caretakers of, of uh, the ecosystems. Actually, they're, they're our care caretakers. Um, and so that's really the remark. It's not just bees. It's actually our ecosystems in general are, are incredibly important for our survival. And it, we're not taking care of them for their sake. We're not saving nature. We're saving ourselves. So just always remember that. <laughs> what are the key regulators for adaptation of these insects? Well, they've got to. They've got to adapt or they die, right? So as the ecosystems change, as they, you know, the, the temperature changes or the, the, per, the amount of food availability or new animals and plants come into an area, either the insects can, can survive in that area and so they don't need to change or they need to change in order to survive. This is the basis of evolution, right? This is how evolution works. So only those organisms that are able to survive in that, that, that particular ecosystem will survive and they will pass those traits on to the next generation. It's not intentional. Insects don't just decide like, oh, I think I'll turn pink today. I mean, they don't do that. It's just that over time, animals that have and plants that have specific traits will be able to survive better in environments. So that's how evolution works. So does carrying insects from outside into the labs cause them any harm? Absolutely. They cannot survive in many cases when you bring them into the lab. That's one of the reasons why we study them mostly outside. 
we try not to study them in the in the lab um, unless and until we have to. Studying them out in their natural ecosystem is the best way of understanding them. That's what a naturalist does, and that's why we're called the NICE lab, the Naturalist Inspired Chemical Ecology Lab. And so. Shannon, just uh, in addition to that particular answer you just gave, um, someone on YouTube is asking about how you can um, sort of um, increase people's empathy for insects, uh, especially among, you know, uh, young people and um, generally uh, the uh, people who might not have this kind of love for insects. I don't know, do you have more empathy audience after hearing me and hearing these amazing stories? Definitely. I don't know, that's, that's the only way I know how to do it. Just tell these stories, you know, go take your, take your children, take your siblings, take your family on, on nature walks. You know, there's lots of parks and things you can go to. Even during this time, you can still actually go outside, even though it's much scarier right now with the, with the crisis. But, you know, just take them outside on the balcony if you can do nothing else. Try to get a plant, uh, uh, some, some, some flowers and plants there. Insects will come to them. Have them, have them just walk. You know, and just and just and watch, uh, walk, watch. Sorry, I used the wrong word. Watch and see these insects, and 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 get some understanding of how important they are, and tell these stories. And if you are authors, and if you're artists, write stories about these insects. We have so few stories about our Indian species. It, it was very difficult for me with my daughter growing up in Bangalore to find some really nicely written stories. She can read Kannada and Hindi. And I wanted to try to find some stories for her in those languages and there's far too few. We need much, much better awareness in the public, especially in India about our, uh, how important and how amazing our insects are. And we've got them in our backyard. Great. Um, I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much to everyone for all of your questions. And thank you to Shannon, because this has been really, really enlightening for me as well. I had so much fun learning about all of these insects. Um, <laughs> I'll just quickly hand it over to, uh, to um, Mahin or Sadamini, if they'd like to say something. Yeah. Yeah. So is that okay, Mahin? Yeah. I'll, I'll kind of want to thank you. Uh, that was an enthralling talk with lots of interesting stories and evident by so many questions. Uh, and also, I think people got definitely inspired to appreciate insects around us. And uh, I wish to thank uh, you for taking the time to share so much knowledge and inspire people. And I also wish to thank the communications team, all of you, uh, Mahin, Chandrakant, and Pavitra for hosting this uh, session at another webinar today. Um, and uh, we will see you next week. Uh, next week at 11 a.m. back uh, when Radhika, uh, Dr. Radhika Venkatesan will talk about plant insect interactions. So the story will continue, but in a different way. Uh, so we will see you next week. Until then, please take care. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. You Be sure to share the talk on YouTube. Uh, we've got a recording up there as well. And Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.